Hello and welcome back to You Want to Do What with Dan and Julie. Today we have Giles English on, uh, one of the co-founders of Braymont. Hi, Giles. Hi, how are you both? Good, yeah, good. Well, how thanks. are you? Yeah, very well. It's a slightly rainy day today, but um, uh, a, a Friday afternoon before a bank holiday, so it's not that bad. <laughs> so do you want to tell us a bit about Braymont and how you sort of started the whole uh, watch company? Yeah, sure. So, so we, um, I sort of grew up, with an amazing father, a PhD aeronautical engineer from Cambridge who um, had some brain the size of a bus, but he uh, loved building things and had this passion for watches and clocks that he grew up with. And um, as well as other things like aviation, um, he was now an ex-RF pilot. And so with this sort of idyllic upbringing, I then went to go and study engineering at university. And um, uh, 1995, um, it all went, horribly wrong dad was practicing for an with her brother and they crashed and dad died um instantly. oh my god and and very near you guys in chelmsford um where they crashed and uh um nick amazingly got picked up by air ambulance and taken to whitechapel hospital and shouldn't have survived but did and and that that was a sort of moment that completely changed our lives and uh with that's with the sort of the light bulb moment of let's go and follow this sort of passion we had and and everyone thinks watchmaking, high-end watchmaking is all Swiss made. But if mm. you go back 100 years, we're making half the world's watches in the UK. And Rolex was founded in Clerkenwell. The world sets its time by Greenwich Mean Time. So it's mm. a sort of amazing history. And uh, it, uh, we sort of, you know, you hit this tipping point where you say, well, look, I could be dead tomorrow. Let's go and do something I, I love doing. And um, so that, that's, that was the sort of foundation. We then went to... Um, Switzerland, uh, back and forth for about five, six years, um, and then slowly brought the manufacturing back to the UK. And um, uh, we're based in Henley on Thames now, and um, have about 130 odd people there building watches. And um, but it's a really complicated business, watchmaking, because you're sort of we're high end watchmaking, so you know these watches go for quite a lot of money. Um, at a starting price, probably two and a half thousand pounds. So mm-hmm. you're you're, but you're, we're an engineering company foremost. We're making something that's very complicated. Um, we're machining to about five microns. A human hair is about 60 microns. Wow. So, so the, you're, you're, you're making these tiny bits of sort of tolerances, bits of metal, but constant gears. And yet you also, we own our own shops. Um, you're in retail, you're building a global brand. Um, uh, people won't buy a watch unless they've heard about you. So you're sort of you have to be very good at marketing. So it's a massively challenging business, but um, you know it's 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 a fascinating thing to get into. And I think whether whether it's um, uh, um, engineering or or marketing or film or production, there are so many opportunities in in, in that world. Um, and you're not in the technology arms race. So you know what Bremont's doing will be here and. 50, 200 years time because you're, 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 you're building on something. So it's a, it's a lovely sector to be in. That must have been incredibly daunting to sort of set out. And like you say, everybody uh, immediately thinks Swiss made. Um, but like you say, the history is in the UK. How hard was it to start to bring it back to the UK? It's really, really hard because you're sort of, there are, we'd lost all the skill sets in this country for doing that. Yes, you had watch servicing, but in manufacturing design and and when you're talking about building something it's not about the physical you know, machining that component it's about having the engineers behind it who can work those machines the the watch designers who can program the the um uh, d- design um all those sort of elements you have to bring back and, and so we went around to different industries you know formula one arms industry um motorsport um and sort of Nick, well, sort of headhunted uh, <laughs> different different experiences and skill sets to come and come and join us. Um, and you just can't do it that quickly. So every year you're making a bit more, you're bringing a bit more over. And we would never have been able to do this without the support from the Swiss. Um, but it's been um, uh, a, a very interesting journey and something we're sort of continually going down. And your watch is, um, obviously, you said uh, machined and designed to quite a high tolerance. They're actually uh, 
you try and like specialize in like aviation or sort of like survival things like that so your watches are not just a luxury watch they then have an extra layer on top of trying to work in these extreme environments yeah we we see what i love a mechanical watch so you, it, you generally you, you get quartz watches which are watch with a battery and a smart watch is sort of eye watch i think or a mechanical watch we have no battery it's all cogs and gears but what I love is if you're, you know, Scott, when he went and did the South Pole, he, he had a mechanical watch with him. Um, ben Saunders, when he went and retraced Scott's footsteps of um, one of our ambassadors, he had to use a mechanical watch because a quartz battery powered watch would die within sort of four or five days because the, uh, the cold temperatures just killed battery life. So he needed the old school technology. And, and what's lovely about that is that, you know, a mechanical watch we sell now will work in 200 years' time. Yes, you have to service it, but if you break, you can fix it. So it's this sort of lovely, enduring um, timepiece that you'd, you'd hand on. And about 25% of our business is just making for military around the world. So if you're a F-18 pilot and we'll be up build for their squadron, they, they commission something special. Wow. And they, they're, yes, they have GPS head-up displays with accurate time, but actually, um, for them, this 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 watch is is more than just turning the time on their wrist. It's something that signifies where they got to. They'll give it to their son and then their grandson. You know, it's, it, they become serious collectors' pieces. It's very cool. You're almost creating a piece of history. Um, and there's there's a certain watch, right, for the aviation um, arm that if you eject out of a plane, you get a special special watch. Is that right? Yeah, there's a. We work with this um, amazing business called Martin Baker, who uh, a British company makes 70 odd percent of the Western world's ejection seats. And, and uh, yeah, we create a watch with them, started about 10 years ago, that you can only get it if you've been ejected. <laughs> <laughs> um, quite a special watch and not an easy one to get hold of. Yeah, I bet. Um, the brand that you, you're building um, feels very uh, heritage. You know, you worked with Jaguar, worked with England Rugby, BA, and uh, you mentioned Martin. Um, is that very much the uh, what you wanted to create and where you want to take the brand? I think partnerships for a company, and especially there's several reasons we do it. One, we, you know, myself, my pro design our watches. So if I'm working with a Martin Baker or a a Boeing or a British Airways, um, you you get this amazing sort of design philosophy coming from them. So with British Airways, we worked with a supersonic watch celebrating 50 years of the Concorde. So you go into the archives of Concorde, you design something really classically beautiful based off that aircraft. So they're sort of inspiring. Also on a on a pure branding level, it, it you know we share each other's databases, so everyone wins in promoting. Mm. Uh, the, the, the products um, and we sort of have these pillars one is British engineering and, and that's you know, engineering as much as the U, in the UK as you can but it's also working with other British companies we're sort of going around the world waving their flag but because there are over 750 Swiss watch companies and we're the only British so it's a bit of a differentiator wow we're the, oh, you're the only British companies to manufacture watches well um, with the only British watch company you can uh, making them in the UK and you can go wow. and buy off buy off a, um, a standard retailer's shelf. Um, there's a few online businesses, but it's they're making them in Switzerland or elsewhere. Um, We've obviously uh, spoken about uh, making it in England and Britain, and your surname's um, English. Yeah, you have a, a French name for your company. How did uh, that come about? Yeah, sort of, uh, that's slightly just confusing the subject. But, uh, <laughs> So we started out, we, we could have gone and bought an old British watch brand, a Harrison and Budge at Tompion, you know, one, one of the great British watchmakers. Mm. Um, but we didn't want to, because the whole thing was about, we are, uh, um, it was creating something new that we did, weren't sort of shackled with history. Um, and obviously my surname's English, we couldn't call it English. Uh, <laughs> And about three years after Dad died, Nick and I were in an old old aircraft flying through France, and we got stuck in some terrible weather. And this is days before GPS, and we had to for, force land in a French farmer's pea field. Oh my and word! In England, you do that. You just give the farmer a bottle of whiskey and say sorry. And <laughs> but in France, they impound your aircraft. They you know cost thousands of pounds. They make you ship it to a 
license airstrip and all that stuff. So it's a nightmare. And we landed, and this lovely old boy said, "Look, quick, put your put the plane in here in an old hay barn." And, and we ended up staying another couple of days. And he was restoring his old tractors and up to his motorbikes and carriage clocks. And and he, my dad died when he was forty nine, and this this guy was in his late seventies, and um, he just sort of you know it had my father lived to his eight, late seventies would have been this old boy, and and his name was Antoine Bremont, and. Uh. Uh, um, we we went away and we thought, actually, Bramon, that's a nice sounding name. That's sort of, uh, I'll work on a watch. And uh, called him up and said, look, we're not relating this this to you in any way, shape or form. Um, uh, but yeah, we want to use the name Bramon. And, ah, crazy English man. And, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think that might actually be the coolest origin story of any yeah. company name ever. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, you obviously also spoke and you said you went to uh, university and studied uh, engineering. Um, do you come at the watchmaking and design of it from an engineering perspective? Is that something uh, you do yeah. within the company? Well, it's, I think the, like anyone can be a watch design. You don't need to have gone to do engineering to, to do watch design. Um, you, you, you can learn this stuff. You don't, and, and this is part of my problem with, with a lot of universities. It's, it's, you know, doing engineering at universities is ridiculously technical. Um, I mean, we're doing sort of, you spend your day doing maths and other stuff and and vocationally does that really help you and where you want to go and and no it doesn't a lot of time it just gives you the confidence that you've um, it, you've got through this massive hurdle um so no you, you, you there are other ways to do it i think if you went into um uh, uh graphical design um uh, you know old vocational courses you you would easily you know, make that transfer into, into watch design. Um, then after, after university, I was going to go into uh, um, engineering and I, I got poached by the city to go into corporate finance. And um, I did that for a couple of years and, and quickly realized I was going to be no good at that. <laughs> um, absolutely useless. But um, I learned a lot in the process. And I think you know, being able to learn to read a balance sheet and um, you know, set of accounts is, is incredibly useful in life if you if you want to go down that sort of entrepreneurial um, route. Um, Are there courses and colleges out there that um, specialise in watch design and watch making? Um, so you've got things like we sponsor the British School of uh, Watchmaking, which um, you can go and train to be a watchmaker there. And they, they do a brilliant course. They do a, a year and a half course or a three year course. And if you've got the mental the state to go and want to be a watchmaker, it's a brilliant course to go and do. I'd definitely go and apply. Um, you know, we offer some apprenticeships um, uh, where we, we train um, watchmakers up. Um, for actual watch design, there's nothing in the UK. There is in Switzerland, um, but nothing in the UK you could, you know, directly go and train in watch design it's very much you go into more of a general design course and then go and work for a business in, in watch design um, and um, but you can easily transfer those skills from from other industries and then um, to get into actual movement design um, as opposed to visually how a watch works that is another step up as well that that's you, that's ridiculously complicated. You have to train as a watchmaker and as an engineer, and then make that transition into actually, because um, you know, you're designing things like gear teeth profiles and all of that sort of stuff, and, and that's that's quite. Yeah, there's a lot of maths that go into a uh, gear yeah. teeth and uh, that stuff. <laughs> very technical. So, what is uh, an average day for, say, one of your watchmakers at Braemont? Um, you look like you've got a fantastic. You've built a new facility, or you're in the process. What are they actually doing day to day? Yeah, it's sort of into when you sort of talk talk about watchmaking. There's there's a number of different areas. You can be in the um, the machining side where you're machining parts. So that is programming big CNC machines to um, go and cut very small components. Um, that's sort of one end, the design uh, engineering side. To be an actual watchmaker, we split that down into watch assembly so that is um 
uh, coming in the morning, you're given a big box of components and you spend your day building the watch out of those components. Wow. So there you are with a little, little um, uh, monocle on your, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, at a specially constructed bench and in silence you're building these, these little puzzles. And it's not for everyone. A lot of people, they may even have the dexterity skills, but they sit down, they just can't cope with that because it's a very, um, a, you, you are building puzzles all day long. But if you like that, then it is a perfect job because you are perfecting the skill every day. And, um, and so that's the watch assembly. You'll then have um, watch servicing where you're getting watches in and you're stripping them all down, cleaning them, seeing which components are worn and replacing those components and building that watch back up. Um, you also have around a business like this, um, uh, a very advanced stock control systems. Um, so that is picking the components, managing the stock. Um, and you'd also have a, a very big quality control department. So every watch that's made, you're testing it for weeks on end. You are um, putting it through, you know, whether it's pressure testing, time testing, visual testing, um, and that's a big part of it. So it's a sort of, in that whole watch manufacturing space, it's actually a, a rather um, yeah, detailed, complex sort of a mechanism you're working with. Those tests, actually, uh, I watched a video on some of the tests you do before a watch is released, and they're actually really impressive, uh, some of those. It is, because you'll think you're, if someone's spending a lot of money on buying a watch, um, they want it to be perfect, and if there's a tiny speck of dust on it, um, they will spot it at some point, or a scratch, or if it's, you know, it hasn't been um, accurately tested in timing terms. And, and we, you know, we only make chronometer rated watches, and that means that that watch has been um, independently tested before we build a watch to um, over 15 days. It has to be plus six, minus four seconds. Wow. And in a day, if you think there's 86,400 seconds, <laughs> got little colts and gears ticking around and it's that accurate it's, it's pretty damn impressive and um yeah that that's that's what i always you know there's something which is just lovely about the whole watchmaking space it, it seems like it's mind-blowingly intricate you know or, or what these watchmakers are doing what is the sort of innovation like at Braemar? do you let them you know try this try that is that kind of process there yeah, you have to be slightly careful in in when you set up production is that actually people stick to processes and but then you steadily improve them the whole time. Um, and I think you know, having the right people to improve processes um, uh, that's that's a skill set in it in its own own way. And that's about you know, how efficient can you build stuff. So. Uh, part of our whole new facility we're building it it's about improving their workflow that um, lean manufacturing it's, it is exactly that and you um can you automate a process here to make it better so you know for example you know you're scratching x number of case bags putting them on over over a year well can you improve that process so you scratch less so you have far less loss of stock and that you're constantly looking at detail and detail and, and um, if, if you're that way um, if, if you've got that mentality it's, it's a fascinating industry to be in what sort of uh, personality traits are you looking in um, watchmakers when they uh, come through the door um it's good now yeah, that's quite a, a good question i think i think you're a, a watchmaker it's someone who loves the detail has slight ocd about the way they do things um uh they have the um the the, the, the mental focus to actually sit down at a desk building these watches for hours on end and and not everyone can do that but if if you are if your brain is on that spectrum then it really is a, a, a really, really interesting space um, for, for someone to be in. And I knew from, from training up as a um, watch assembler to 
a, a full watchmaker where you can service watches is probably a six or seven year period. Wow. And when you come through all of that, actually, you've got a, quite a lot of value as an individual. And is that generally stuff that you um, you would have someone learn through experience um, there before they get those seven years? Um, yeah, there's sort of two ways. To, we train a percentage of that ourselves, and then we send send our watchmakers off to be uh, to have some independent courses as well. And we've had watchmakers we we train up and then send to the British School of Watchmaking. Um, they will get their qualifications and then come back to us. So um, yeah, that's 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 an interesting space to be in. We we sort of touched on the whole marketing element of the Braemont watches a bit earlier. But you, you've got some fantastic brand ambassadors, sort of the likes of Tom Curry, England Rugby, um, Ross Edgeley. I mean, there's, uh, and you've got Ronnie Wood to do some uh, special watches for you. Do you. That must be a really fun, exciting part of the business. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a, you, know, you, you spend a chunk of your day making sure you're, you're building something beautiful and sort of very high spec. And then you have a part of the day you're trying to market that and then a part of the day where you're designing new products and looking for new inspiration. And yeah, and, and working with something like a Ronnie Wood is, is it covers a number of those areas off because you're, you, you, you've got this great character in Ronnie who you know is going to promote your product very well. And mm. you're sitting down with him saying, look, how do we create something quite unique? And, and he came, we, we had this lovely chat and he said, look, I, I want to paint some watches. I'm, I'm an artist and on tour in the U S he hand painted, you know, 37 dials of watches and, and, and made this, this beautiful collection of watches and quite unique. Um, uh, on other areas of marketing, it's about anything from, you know, if you're into photography, um, you're creative, um, you know, the, you know, Instagram and Facebook and all of those have become such powerful marketing channels. Now. Mm that you can create stuff in house. So you're, you're looking for individuals um, who can work within your organization. So you want to do as much in house as possible rather than outsourcing stuff. Um, and I think, you know, it, nowadays, if you, if you've got that creative eye, because not everyone does, it's, there are so many options out there. If you can, if you can create video and, and do photography, almost any business needs that in-house now mm. whereas before you you know you just outsourced it all and um, it is so powerful social media and you know creating podcasts and all of those other stuff that if you're in a consumer facing brand that, that we are um, you need to communicate the stuff you're doing definitely actually one of my favorite films is the uh the kingsman secret service very sort of british you know the spy <laughs> thing you made some watches for them right that was great. So we, um, I got a call one day from our, um, uh, our uh, store manager in, in Mayfair, and he said, um, "I'm just standing here, and Claudia Schiffer and Matthew Vaughan just walked into the store." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think it's more interesting than Claudia Schiffer than Matthew. <laughs> um, then uh, and and Matthew, you know, he'd written this film and is producing it. Um, and he had a mate who worked in, who was in the military. And Matthew said, I'm, I'm in the film. I want to do work with a watch brand that fires these darts and does some cool stuff. And his mate said, look, there's, there's only one brand he's talked to. It's Bremont because they make the military and um, it's bang on and the whole Britishness of it. So, um, yeah, we, we, we made some watches for the film. And um, actually, my brother was in the film. And, um, oh, really? He has a sequence when they're all around the table. <laughs> but, and actually, it's always a bit risky because you, you, if some of these films can really flop, and be terrible. Yeah. Um, but luckily, I'm just talking to Matthew and I loved Leg Cake and you know, those previous films he's done and um, you know, Lock, Stock and everything. And mm. um, uh, the script just looked, yeah, it is sort of, James Bond with a bit of humour thrown in and uh, um, that was lovely to be part of. And that's all part of, you know, can you as a brand get involved with these interesting things that help build your brand but are on brand as well? Because it's not about doing everything. People have to, all the touch points they come across, they have to go, actually, that's quite cool. That's, that's what it is. And, and I realised 
it took a bit of while to do it, but you, you, you can't try and please everyone when you're building a brand. We are who we are. And um, if you try and please everyone, you become very vanilla because mm. you know, um, in all the stuff you're involved with. And I think uh, while the Kingsman's cool, I think Tom Hardy wearing it in Venom was uh, a bit cool in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a nice guy, Tom. He really is. And, um, a, a real, a real gentleman. Um, so it's, you know, it's been lovely working with him on that. Tom. Do you have a, a favorite sort of event or, or something you've done with the marketing? Cause you, you like, we just talked about so many amazing things the brand's done, but do you have a standout favorite? Do I have a standout favorite? Um, you know, it's a sort of when you're, when you're starting out and you get these little breaks, um, they, they, they are so massive for you at the time. In hindsight, you, you're always looking forward because you can't really sort of rely on stuff you've done. But, um, your favorite, I think, you know, Kingsman was great because it, it, the film did so so well globally, and, and we're a big part of it. But you know, ever since we started working with Martha Baker on the ejection watch and all the technology built up there, and um, you know, being asked to work with Boeing or um, uh, there's a few other interesting projects we're working on at the moment, Jaguar cars. Yeah, you know, we'd started making um, clocks for their concept cars, and it. Um, Ian Callum, the, uh, the chief designer who's recently left, um, was doing a, a car you may have seen in the last James Bond film, so a very cool Jaguar. But, um, very cool. We, we did a, a mechanical clock for that car. And then they said, oh, we, we, we want to celebrate the Jubilee. Will you build a pocket watch for Prince Philip? So we and made him a pocket watch. That wow. Or, so sort of, uh, these things go on and they, you, you create these, uh, these amazing things. And, um, I tell you what, this, the stuff I'm proud of on is all this sort of, or not each of our big limited editions. Every year we have a limited edition, and we did this. Um, we, we realized quite quickly we could raise quite a lot of charity with those limited editions as well. Mm. So we did a watch called the Code Breaker with Bletchley Park. Um, uh, we did a um, watch called the Victory, raising funds to um, uh, restore HMS Victory. So you're, you're doing some really cool, interesting projects. And, and raising a lot of charity at the same time. I think those little uh, extra things, but what is what makes people fall in love with a brand even more, as well. Yeah, I, th- I think you know, people are spending a lot of money on this stuff, I, I, and I, and I think you can't, as a brand nowadays, you can't hide away. You got to be ch- be doing good stuff, and people will see through that if you're not. Um, and actually, as a it, when Nick and I are running this, that's what gives us a, a real buzz. Yeah. Is is if you can do some good, make a bit of money, employ lovely people, and you know, then suddenly um, it, it sort of fulfills why you are an entrepreneur in the first place, I think. What are some of the biggest positives you think uh, being a watchmaker or involved in the watch industry you, you could take? I th- think... Um, the, the, the wonderful thing about the watch industry is it's so varied. So you can, you know, as I was saying before, whether it's a watchmaker or marketing or retail, um, you're working on a global stage, but you're also working with a lovely, tangible product. Um, you're, I think anyone, if you're going to go to work, you need to really enjoy it. And I think um, if you enjoy the product, then it makes life so much easier because you generally uh, connect with that thing. And, and I think, so it's, it's a fascinating industry to be in. And I think um, if things like retail, for example, anyone thinking of going to retail, it, we, we all hear that retail's dead and um, you know, it's having a lot of problems obviously at the moment. Um, but actually you know, retail just needs rejuvenation. It new, needs, interesting creative people going in it needs to be when you go to a shop it needs to be an experience mm. um, it needs to be so much more fun and interesting than buying off amazon or or online and then it will work so i think it just takes being creative and um i think when you go through what we've been through um as a as a company everyone is being having to change what they do and 
you have to cut costs in one place, but invest in other places to grow. Mm. Again. And I think it's very tricky for anyone looking for a job now. But I think um, there will be new opportunities coming out as everything's just shifting very quickly. Retail has fast forwarded five years within about three months. Wow. Um, you know, so much more demand has gone online. Um, but that doesn't mean that all those jobs won't be taken up elsewhere. Um, so virtual retailing will be a massive play. You, know, you going onto our website and buying a watch by talking on a video link and and then putting your arm down and through augmented reality, the watch appears on your wrist and all wow. that. that. That will all be here very soon. And um, it, it's, so it's just changing the way things and the way you change. So the watch industry, although you're building a product that has it really not changed that much in a hundred years, actually the way you sell that product, market it is, is so innovative. And, and that's why I think it's a lovely industry. And what would be some of the uh, less favorable um, elements of the industry? Um, less favorable um, depends what you like or not. Like I said. <laughs> Fair um, enough. The, no, there's retail um, is cyclical. It does have some hard times, and uh, you know, if we look at COVID, you know, retail is being massively affected. And I think that's and and you have to if you're going to come in. I think. If you're a young person going into a new career, you, you've got to choose that job and the, choose that company so it actually works for you as an individual. So, for example, when we're choosing people to come work for Bremont, they have to like change. They have to come into work one day and their role may have changed slightly because the world has changed. Some people love that. Some people hate it. And they want to be in a big corporate structure where everything's very crystal clear. And, mm. and if, you, if you're that person and you go and work with a company like us, um, you're not going to enjoy it so much. But So I think whatever you do, you really look at that company and look at yourself. And, and I also think in life, we... We think we, we chastise ourselves for not being good at certain things. You cannot be good at everything. And the quicker you learn your strengths and weaknesses in life, the quicker you can actually face up to it. And, um, you know, ego is the worst thing because it, it, it clouds your view on yourself. Um, but really, you know, say I'm good at this. I'm bloody good at this. I'm going to focus on that. I'm not so good at that. And, and find a job that really works for your strengths. Mm. so we we like to talk a little bit about money on the show um but we're talking here about watchmakers we did a little bit of research on salaries and we'll give you some average figures and see if it sets right with you so from around about 25 to, to sort of 32 maybe 35 does that sort of sound right for a watchmaker um i think the up, the upper can go up to probably 55 if you want. wow okay wow if, you're, if you've got that experience under your belt and what would be something that's uh, not in the job description uh, for a watchmaker? Not in the job description. Yeah, that they may have to deal with every now and then or day to day. I think um, you need to deal with, there has to be, and it's not in a natural watchmaker's persona, um, occasionally there will be stress. There will be a client who's upset because their watch isn't working, because they've broken it or... Uh, <laughs> or something or other so you have to be able to um uh have that conversation you you need to um uh you need to put your hand up occasionally and say look this is this is i'm noticing this in the production flow can we sort it out and not um just have your head down um uh in the watch and i think that's it's it's very difficult being in a production chain um and and doing both so you're, you're trying to just be as efficient as possible but also um put your hand up and be a team player um it often does they, they both don't go together i guess this next question is a bit of a two-parter um so how do you progress within the industry as a watchmaker but also where are you going to take braymont forward in the next few years where do you want to see it go um 
so for us, we we every year we want to build more and more components in the UK, um, and we're ambitious as a business. We want to. We don't see why we can't be a lot bigger um, and build that brand around the world. Um, so that's that's a big focus from us. But it's you know, you you have your highs and lows, and there's no doubt that um, COVID has has not been. Um, good for anyone in our space, um, but uh, but I think with with the new move to our new facility, and I think with um, we believe we've got some, you know it, it really exciting times ahead for us. Um, but you have to innovate, you have to change. You can't just do the same thing every year and expect it to work. And what worked last year won't necessarily work next year. And uh, would you still go into the industry knowing what you know now? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, no, very yeah. much. I, I would go into it. I think uh, the I think it's a lovely industry. The people in it are lovely. The retailers are lovely, um, and um, yeah, it's it's an industry of gentlemen and and making something. Yeah, when you talk about luxury, it's it's not just about it's not about money. It shouldn't be in my mind. It's about making something that's beautiful and going to last forever. And I think you know, in the modern days, you know, I, I'll buy an iPhone for a thousand quid and I'm going to chuck it away in two years' time, and that's yeah. just such a waste in my my book. Whereas you're building something that that really is environmentally friendly. It will stay around. Um, and every year it almost matures and, and becomes more precious in its own way. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Jars. I really enjoyed that. Super passionate about what you do and your watches, uh, they look great as well. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate it, both of you. And um, well done for putting all this together. And um, yeah, you know, wish, wish everyone looking for jobs, new careers, um, all the best. Thank you. We're, Where can uh, people find you on uh, Instagram? Um, uh, at Giles English or watches. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Giles. Speak soon. You take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.